Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, I want to just say something. Say something. Mm -hmm. Okay, just we'll give, the president, we'll give the, the first question to all of them. Mm -hmm. Is that okay? Yes, we're ready. We're ready. Okay, sure. No, I'm ready. You're ready. Okay. Please. No, I want to. <laughs> this one is better. Pull ahead, better right there. Thanks. Okay, Mr. Okay. Yes. Your first few questions. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. President. Um, um, we obviously, as the SAPC, um, would also like to have a bite uh, at posing our own questions uh, around your state visit. Uh, Mr. President, you come to the UK when the country really is battling with energy at home, and you did touch on those areas uh, when you were uh, addressing businesses. Um, but then there's the, a sense at home that their president is running away from dealing with the issues at home, so he's always on the road. So how do you respond to those critics who are saying um, instead of focusing, staying at home and dealing with the issues that are of utmost importance, you get onto the plane, <laughs> onto the next destination. And then my second question, um, yes, you are the head of state, Mr. President, but there's a vehicle that takes you there, which is your party. So unfortunately, you can't not ask about it. So two days ago, uh, we saw some of the official nominations um, it appears that uh, you have the majority of branch nominations. So what does that say? So does that mean uh, you certainly are taking the second term if elected by the ANC uh, in, the, in less than a month? Thank you. My visits to a number of countries to either go on state visits as well as attending various forums like the G20 and COP27 were well announced in advance. We made it a point that we should inform the country that these were visits that are going to take place. When I went to the UN, uh, we then came to the UK for the burial of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II and after that we had moved to a higher level of uh, load shedding and I shortened my trip and I went back home to attend to the challenges that we face and I've done that on two occasions. I was heavily criticised for coming back home and why do I abandon uh, visits that could benefit South Africa? Uh, and this time round, this visit to the UK uh, was well known and well ad uh, announced. And even as I left, we were uh, having the challenge of uh, increased load shedding. And it had to do with uh, diesel shortage, uh, financial challenges, which I am continuously attending to with ministers. I have ministers whose job is to address these issues. And once we've got the framework, such as the one that we put in place to address our energy challenges, ministers as well as the executives of those entities are meant to address that. And I remain in constant contact up to three, four times a day, being informed on what is happening and putting forward uh, proposals and taking decisions. So much as I want to be present in the country, uh, all the time to address all the challenges that we have, there are times when we've got to also uh, get those who are supposed to do the work to do the work themselves and I then do other work which is put South Africa on the global map and advocate for increasing investments in our country that is the job that head of state must do supported by ministers and I brought together four ministers here and we've all been involved in a variety of actions 
and uh, interventions to promote investment in the country, to put South Africa on not only the UK map, but the global map, because this type of state visit is, uh, if you like, beamed across the world. And uh, this is a place where uh, a number of investors uh, are present. And in the end, uh, the UK still represents the biggest foreign direct investors uh, into South Africa. So we've got to talk to them. We've got to get them further interested in our country and invest more and also participate in our transformation process. And uh, that message is an important message to put across to them. But the other important one was to also tell them about our just energy transition, but also to inform them that we need more funding, particularly for your more developed economy countries, that they must live up to the commitments they made in Paris, they must also live up to the commitments they made at COP26. And now, the, the recent move that developing economy countries are making is that there should be compensation for damage uh, that has been done to uh, our climate. Coming to the ANC process, uh, that, that is a transparent ANC process. Uh, that everyone has been aware of. And as for me, I'm humbled and uh, truly honored uh, by those branches that have indicated their support. And uh, I was asked by the Electoral Committee whether I accept the nomination. I said yes. I humbly accept the nomination. And in the end, it is not for me to decide. It is for the branches and the delegates who will come to the conference. And let's leave the decision to the delegates who are mandated by branches to take the final decision. Thank you. Amanda? <coughs> Mr. President, how are you? My name is Amanda Koz. I'm from the Sunday Times. I'm a president's correspondent. Um, I just want to follow up on my colleague's uh, question about the ANC, and that would be, why do you think that you deserve a second term? And could the president take us into uh, your meeting with the prime minister in so far as what did you discuss uh, and, and how are you going to follow up on these agreements and make sure that what they've committed to, they will do? Um, thank you, Mr. President. Why do I deserve a second term? I think that should be a question that should be really asked to the delegates because they are the ones who have nominated me. But as for me, I think what we've been doing in the past few years is to build a foundation to rebuild our country. Uh, when we came in, uh, a lot of things were damaged. Things were not working as well as they should. A number of our institutions had been captured, as uh, was evidence in the Zondo Commission. And um, a number of reforms needed to be embarked upon at the economic level. But this is a task that we've been involved in. But in the intervening period, as we all know, we had a number of other new challenges like COVID-19, the unrest, the floods, and all these interrupted the processes that we had wanted to embark upon to reposition South Africa. But I do believe that a great deal of work has been done of a preparatory nature, consolidating the foundation and preparing us for uh, exciting opportunities that are going to be on offer, which we are ready to take up. Uh, our economy is currently challenged, and the unemployment that we are going through now was exacerbated by COVID-19. Two million people who lost their jobs uh, during covid uh, for an economy as small as ours to lose two million jobs in a short space of time of 18 months is, is a huge, huge disaster. So we have to rebuild uh, from that. We've got to uh, rebuild our institutions, which we are doing. The reforms that we have embarked upon 
are recognized and are appreciated by a number of key role players, particularly those who invest both internally and externally. They recognize that we are uh, on a path to reform, to introduce reforms in our economy. Uh, we are addressing uh, issues that have to do with uh, corruption, uh, criminality, and all that work uh, in my book is positive work that is consolidating a very good foundation for South Africa to be repositioned. We are attending to infrastructure built and really getting ready uh, so that more and more infrastructure projects can get off the ground because one of the challenges that we have faced is just project preparedness. We found that there are serious weaknesses at the level of just preparing projects and getting projects uh, to get off the ground. So that sterling performance that we had moving towards 2010 is what we want to bring back. Uh, we lost a lot of skilled people, lots of engineers, uh, have left and we are now building new skills with young people coming to the fore but we've, we've got to consolidate all that work. So in the coming period I think we are poised for much better uh, growth and uh, great opportunities that we can take up and the good thing is a number of key role players both internationally and internally are seeing the changes. Some people say it's been slow, we've not been moving fast enough. And of course, everybody wants everything to move very quickly. In fact, they wanted to move yesterday. But some things have had to be put in place so that when we do take off, uh, it becomes a meaningful takeoff. On the, for instance, people have been complaining that there are no prosecutions, uh, uh, people who have been complicit in wrongdoing uh, during state capture, nothing is being done to them. Uh, and I've been saying, uh, wait and see, processes are underway, and now it is beginning to happen. Uh, so the great opportunities await South Africa going forward. As regards the meetings that we had with the Prime Minister, we, we had uh, a really great meeting with the Prime Minister. I had a tete a tete with him first, and we touched on a number of uh, important issues that have to do with uh, the relationship between the United Kingdom and South Africa in our working lunch. We touched on issues of trade, of investment, of the just energy transition, and uh, we put our message across very strongly that we want investments to be upgraded and uh, more and more uh, British uh, companies to invest in our country. That message was well received and uh, we saw evidence of that when we went to the business forum because of the business forum a number of British uh, company CEOs said we are investing, we're going to be investing more money in energy and in infrastructure and we prepared to work with South African companies and some of them even added a very wonderful element that we're also focusing on community development uh, where we are invested uh, to focus on how we can uh, support the communities where our uh, companies operate. So that for me was, was very positive. On the trade side, we said we want to see increased trade between South Africa and the UK. We uh, sell manufactured products like um, vehicles, uh, but we also stressed that there are constraints on a number of items such as wine. Uh, we want to sell more wine uh, to the UK and uh, I characterize that that is a very happy item that should make everybody happy in the UK. So we want more wine to be brought to the UK. The quota uh, needs to be doubled. We want to bring more sugar to the UK and the quota should also be doubled. And canned fruit. Uh, we've got can fruit manufacturing companies in South Africa that are struggling right now. So with increased 
uh, quota on, on canned fruit, we will be able to, to export more. So we, 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 we articulated that viewpoint, and of course, we, we want uh, the just energy transition, which the UK is a part of, uh, to be uh, underpinned by, by increased grants. Uh, we calculated the grant component of the $8.5 billion, and we said it only amounts to 2.7%, uh, and we'd like that to be upgraded largely due to the fact that South Africa already carries a huge uh, debt burden, and uh, the just energy uh, transition should be a transition that is going to ensure that we address the challenges that workers are going to face and the challenges that communities where our fossil uh, fuel-generating power stations are as we transition from uh, those power stations into renewable energy and as we build new industries and as we create new and uh, uh, job, new jobs in those industries in the hydrogen economy uh, or sector, uh, in, in the uh, electric vehicle sector, as well as in the just renewable energy generation. So we see great opportunities here. The UK told us that in years to come they are actually going to ban uh, petrol and diesel vehicles. And we want to be there to produce electric vehicles that can be exported to the UK. Already we bring uh, uh, delivery vehicles to the UK. We want to go into other vehicles as well. So it's, it's been a very good visit from our point of view in terms of um, improving the relationship between the UK and South Africa. It's been most beneficial. and it is, consolidated the foundation that was felt built by Nelson Mandela when he came here in 1996. Uh, Mr. President, Oli Barrett uh, from ENCA. Obviously, energy has been a key focus. Can you point the, the South African people to any deals or agreements or conversations you've had here with government or industry that will have a short-term, even immediate impact back home, or are these things that will come to fruition further down the line? Yes, there, there is almost immediate uh, follow-through. We had an opportunity to dis have discussions with uh, uh, companies that uh, are already invested in the energy sector in South Africa and others who want to come and invest. Uh, there's a company that uh, is going to be investing almost 13 billion pounds into renewable energy construction in South Africa, and they have already started, and uh, they just participated in the recent uh, bid window, and uh, they've been successful, uh, and uh, they, they are now going to start uh, their, their construction process. They did come to our investment conference, I think, this year, and they will be participating in the next year's investment conference. It is in renewable energy where we are seeing quite a lot of growth. But interestingly, other companies want to participate in the green and hydrogen sector, which they see South Africa playing a very big and critical role. And we've identified that in our business plan on the just energy transition as one of the key sectors. Uh, we've, we've got all the natural resources that will uh, boost our capability in that regard. So we are going to see investments, even flowing from just this visit, coming into South Africa. And of course, investments don't happen next week. Uh, you, you plant the seed and then it germinates and thereafter we will see the growth. But I'm very confident and let me say that we, we never for one minute uh, had any business person being negatively disposed towards South Africa. And we never for any minute had even any politician being uh, negative towards South Africa. All we've received here is great positivity from His Majesty the King himself, who is very strong on environmental issues and climate change, right through to everyone else 
uh, that we've been uh, engaging with. So there'll be great benefits to the people of our country flowing from this visit. Um, Mr. President, Arabile um, CNBC. It was around this time in 2014 when the former president asked you to um, basically take charge of ESCOM and try to find a solution for it. It's close to seven years now, and unfortunately still no resolution in that regard. Mm. Is there something you can point towards exactly as to why that is still the case and why it hasn't been resolved thus far? Um, that would be question one. And then the second one would relate to how, I mean, there are UK companies investing about 5.37 billion pounds over a three-year period at the very least now. Uh, that's the commitment that has been made. How much of that would go to the electricity infrastructure um, and how critical is it to prioritize that at a time like this? My involvement uh, with the whole ESCOM process yes, started in 2014 when I was asked by the then president to head the war room. And in the course of doing all that, we were getting reports from the management in, in ESCOM. And uh, there came a time when I actually said the process of the war room is best uh, closed down so that we have a CEO in ESCOM who will be uh, directly involved in helping to address the challenges at ESCOM. And it is myself who proposed that the war room should be closed because the war room in many ways had too many entry points. Everyone uh, was, was trying to uh, put their fingers in and trying to resolve the problems and I realized that it, it just doesn't work. You needed one entry point and that had to be the CEO and it was to that, uh, for that reason that I even suggested that uh, Brian Molefe should be appointed the CEO and I did say that at the, uh, the, the State Capture Commission uh, because I did believe that uh, his capabilities would would help to address the challenges. But little did I know uh, that uh, he was entangled in a whole number of other things. And this has been the case with ESCOM, because ESCOM's problems did not start yesterday or even <laughs> seven years ago. ESCOM's problems started way back. I mean, there was a time when the ESCOM management wanted to build uh, new power stations and they were told that no, uh, don't. Uh, the power stations will be built by the private sector and you just keep the lights on. And at that time, uh, maintenance was also stopped. And I met one, a person who used to be a manager in ESCOM who said uh, they were stopped from maintaining, I mean serious maintenance for 12 years. So you had a period of 12 years where no maintenance was done and the power stations were driven hard and the instruction was keep the lights on. And no wonder today we are reaping the whirlwind because a number of errors were committed. Uh, so that is why I keep saying ESCOM's woes and problems did not start even in 2014. They started way earlier, and you will need to go back seven years or more. And because you're dealing with huge machinery that costs billions to put in place, you need all the skills, you need all the capability, and because these are machines, it's almost like your car. Your car uh, cannot be run forever uh, in a day and years without being serviced, because if you do that, it will break down. Uh, so it, it, it's the time-based process. You need to stop the car, have it properly serviced, and move, stop it again, have it properly serviced. We didn't have that. And when the time, the decision was then taken to build new power stations, those people who used to be well adept, who had the experience to build power stations within ESCOM, they had left because they had been told that we're not building power stations anymore, so they had left. So what you were then left with 
these um, outsiders, original equipment manufacturers, who were not daily involved with the workings of ESCOM in terms of processes, either procurement or uh, performance, who came in, built the power stations. And now we have design problems. Design problems that have come to the fore that are a big challenge at the new power stations that we had built, which we had hoped would be our savior, as it were. Uh, so we are dealing with a combination of problems, and um, we are now trying to fix the plane as it is flying. As we are generating uh, electricity, power stations keep breaking, many of them are old, but we are trying with a new board and with the management that's in place to address this problem. So the problems of ESCOM were seeds that were planted many years ago, uh, rather than in 2014. And because we're dealing with huge, complicated and complex machinery, it's not a one-day fix. It, it, it can never be. Uh, these are very complex processes, but we are working to lessen, uh, you know, the load shedding and to ensure that uh, the money is there. And remember, ESCOM, which used to be the best uh, utility in the world, uh, through, you know, the neglect, the state capture missteps and mistakes, uh, has been reduced to an entity that has a huge uh, debt burden, uh, cannot really fully collect uh, from uh, consumers, and so it's dealing with a multiplicity of problems all at the same time. Do I have confidence that we will solve these problems? Yes, I do. Uh, I do have enormous confidence that we will solve them. But I think it's important to have an appreciation of where we've come from. And obviously, it is very easy to put all the blame on the president, to put all the blame on uh, government, and, and yet these problems have come way back from the past. Govan? Thank you, Mr. President. It's Govan Whittles from Newsroom Africa. Um, at the South Africa House, you <coughs> that the state visit would be underpinned by the need to secure investment to direct, uh, directly address South Africa's economic challenges. The Prime Minister's office pointed to two new bilateral agreements which you guys have concluded and we know that there is the Green Hydrogen Grant which has been announced by the UK government. How much does South Africa want from the UK government in grant format for that Green Hydrogen Grant and, and what are these agreements? And then this week in South Africa, two issues emanating from the courts. One, the killer of Chris Hani, our liberation hero, was granted parole, Janusz Walusz. Uh, at the same time, the court uh, ruled that the granting of medical parole to the former president uh, was unlawful. What, what did you think about the decision to grant the killer of Chris Hani parole? And are you concerned that the decision on the former president has potential to lead to unrest again in our country? How much do we want from <laughs> the uh, British... Uh government. We, we've always said that the more industrialized uh, countries uh, were and have been the greatest polluters uh, and those who have uh, damaged the climate much more than uh, your developing economy countries. For instance, Africa has just been responsible for one percent and uh, our approach is that the polluter must pay. And that is why we are advocating for uh, the approach that says there must be compensation for loss and damage. But having said that, we're also saying that your more developed economies must, in the end, live up to the commitments that they have made in the past. Paris. Uh, COP is the one example where they pledged a hundred billion dollars a year, which they never lived up to, and they also admit that. They are now striking agreements for just energy transition with a number of countries, and our agreement was a trailblazing one. And as we analyzed that agreement, we found that uh, the 
the grant portion of what they've put on the table is, as I said, amounts to 2.7%. We would like that portion of the grant to be lifted. Uh, we've had discussions with one of the European countries and they're prepared to take it to 25% of what they've put forward. And we think a 25% mark uh, would be a good one uh, as a grant, which would then enable us to embark on a just transition process with greater confidence, uh, knowing that we've got partners who are serious about implementing the commitments that they made, particularly to address the loss and damage aspect, and also to be our partners, uh, also as we look at the loan structures, uh, offerings rather that they are putting forward, concessional loans which would come in at really uh, good and low interest rates and uh, which would be stretched over a period that our economies can afford and absorb. Uh, with regard to the judgment uh, on uh, uh, Walus, it is disappointing, I must say, very, very disappointing because uh, Chris Harney was uh, an iconic figure in our struggle. And in fact, if you look at it more carefully, uh, it was uh, our, our democracy, our democracy in the end, as, as we even attained an election date, uh, was pivoted on, on the tragedy that our country went through when Chris Harney was killed. So you could say that Chris Hani's death was part of what spawned the democracy that we have, and it is, it is unfortunate. Uh, but I haven't looked at the judgment closely myself. I would like to, to do so and to see the reasoning. And uh, one cannot but feel the pain that the family and uh, uh, his widow uh, Adim Pohani is, is going through uh, and I haven't had a discussion with her uh, uh, as yet and the family but uh, one feels the heavy pain and the burden that has now been uh, thrust on her shoulders and the family's shoulders. With regard to the judgment on um, the um, the, the parole decision, the medical parole decision that was uh, um, judged upon by, by the court. I do believe that the Department of Correctional Services is going to want to appeal that decision, and I think we should allow that process. Uh, I do not believe that uh, we should see any un unrest through this because there are other processes that will ensue, and uh, the, the, the period of, uh, of uh, that, that whole sentence in my view, as I've heard, has, seems to have already uh, run out. Uh, so the court has made uh, its decision in this regard, and uh, the Department of Correctional Services, and looking at the judgment, has seen reason to want to appeal. And I think we should allow those legal processes uh, to, to, to ensue, and we'll see what happens thereafter. Mosi? Uh, yes, thank you. Good morning. Um, two memorandums of understanding in terms of uh, health and education mm. were signed yesterday. Can you give us some detail in terms of what are the practical programs you're expecting to come out of that? That's my first question. The second one is uh, you have been lamenting for the longest time the effect of uh, Zimbabwean immigration on South Africa. and. Um, the lifting of sanctions against Zimbabwe and re-engagement uh, within the Commonwealth. Did you have that discussion with the King and the Prime Minister, and what was the response to that? Yes, um, on the health and education, we did sign two memoranda. Memoranda that are going to enable the UK and South Africa to work at close range on health matters and uh, the memoranda were signed in the wake of uh, the visit that I had to uh, the Crick uh, Institute, uh, which is a, an, an outstanding 
Research Institute. But in my view, it becomes outstanding because there are South Africans <coughs> who are uh, also working there, who are either learning as, as, as students as, or working there. And uh, for me, it was a joy to see young people from South Africa, from the deep rural areas of our country, excelling and uh, working on processes, including products, medical products like uh, mic accessible microscopes and affordable microscopes that uh, they are developing and hopefully will be made available uh, not only to South Africa but to, to the world. So the research cooperation at that level, which was also underpinned by the Memorandum of Understanding, was for me a great highlight uh, for, for the visit that we had. And on the education side, we had come to the UK also with a clear proposal that we would like to deepen the cooperation at the education level uh, the skills level to have more South African students uh, being given uh, assistance and support to come and learn here. As it is now, we have a program in which 130 PhD South African students or candidates are participating in. When we had a discussion with the Prime Minister, we said we want that uh, to be doubled. We want uh, uh, 260 uh, PhD uh, students to be supported and uh, many more at the master's uh, program level. So the cooperation between our two countries uh, is largely at the practical level. It's no longer just at the theoretical level. It's uh, at the practical level where we, we explore ways in which universities here and colleges here can participate in this program and advance the educational uh, prowess and outcomes for our young people. The Zimbabwe issue inevitably always comes up uh, in meetings like this because we're talking here with uh, uh, the, 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 the country that is like at the head of, of the Commonwealth and uh, we, we advocate for uh, Zimbabwe to be readmitted uh, to the Commonwealth, it's important. Uh, and obviously they're, they're going to mull over that. Uh, we also advocate for sanctions to be lifted, and we've argued that the sanctions that have been imposed on Zimbabwe have uh, uh, a collateral impact, a negative impact on us as South Africa, because as the Zimbabwean economy is weakened, uh, Zimbabweans flow to our own country and exacerbate the challenges that uh, we are having with regard to unemployment and health services and many other services. So, yes, the issue did come up, and these are matters that are continuing to be addressed. Um, Helen? Um, Helen, uh, Agent Smart Press. Uh, good morning, Mr. President. Um, in the context of UK South Africa relations, did King Charles share his vision of the Commonwealth with you? Um, and linked to that, in 2022, is the Commonwealth still relevant to the people of South Africa? And also, could you talk a bit more about the highlights of the trip for you? Please. Yes, when I had uh, a number of conversations with the King, which happened in between what we were doing, either around the meal table or, you know, sitting down to chat. Um, and even as he spoke at the, at the state banquet, <clears throat> uh, I got a very clear distinction of his vision for the Commonwealth. I did not attend the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in Rwanda, but what I did hear from, uh, from those who attended he articulated very clearly uh, the vision that he has. And the vision is pivoted around what I believe is an important uh, statement where he says, we must, we must acknowledge the wrongs of the past. Uh, we must acknowledge that horrible and wrong things were done in the past. 
And it is only when we acknowledge that that we are better positioned to build a better future that can benefit all. That for me was and is an important statement because it is when people acknowledge uh, their history, their past, and are honest to, to deal with that, that we are able to come up with solutions that can open up new opportunities. And in my discussions with the King, I, I found him engaging, I found him open, and I found him uh, as a visionary, particularly on development issues, on issues that have to do with education, on issues that have to do with the environment and climate change. I was uh, uh, quite uh, you know, impressed with his disposition towards these issues and um, and uh, did say that as, as a head of the Commonwealth, these are important issues that uh, he needs to continue advocating, which then brings the issue of the relevance of the Commonwealth. And I do believe that when the Commonwealth rallies around important issues that impact on the lives of ordinary people, uh, contemporary issues such as poverty, such as unemployment and inequality that is widespread in many countries of the Commonwealth other than those who are part of the developed economy countries in the Commonwealth. It is then got going to stand the Commonwealth in good stead. Um, and as he himself looks at issues such as the environment, things like fisheries, things like island states, the challenges that they face, uh, that in itself is going to make the Commonwealth relevant. And it's, in my view, good to, to have a head of the Commonwealth who continues to build on the foundation that Her Majesty the Queen Elizabeth II uh, was able to, 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 to build on, and he will uh, take that forward. So I think it is an important aspect that one needs to recognize about the Commonwealth. Mr. President only forgot to ask his second question, so we'll give, we'll and, give him the... And then the last. Highlights. Oh, oh yes, the highlights. Oh, yes, you asked about the highlights. I just wrote here high, and I didn't know what high meant. <laughs> 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 yes, there have been a number of highlights. I think the key one is just a visit like this helps to consolidate and lift the importance of the relationship between the UK and, and South Africa. It is when I think all key role players, be they business, be they cultural workers or uh, artists and everyone else, see that there are good relations between the two countries, that they are then able themselves uh, to go for great opportunities. So it is important that um, uh, relations between nations should be consolidated and lifted to a higher level. At the economic level, which was really the, the heart of our visit here, we were able, one, to interact with government to get their commitment on the just energy transition, two, to look at trade issues, and get their positive disposition, though we are still going to get involved in further talks. And three, on investment, the, the government continues to see South Africa as the gateway into the African continent, uh, not by sheer positioning at the south, at the tip of the continent, but also in terms of what we have to offer. We're the most industrialized country on the continent, we, we have all the wonderful attributes, a good financial system. We've, we've, we've got uh, you know, a manufacturing base uh, which companies can invest in to be able to, to use South Africa as a launch pad for products that can be you know, sold into the rest of the continent. So we've got all that it takes to, to, to do good business uh, not only with South Africa, but with the rest of the continent. And uh, 
I think the third one for me was uh, the education one. Uh, the education one where the, the UK continues to play an important role uh, in, 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 in education cooperation between the two countries and also just getting more opportunities for our young people to come and learn here is important. The fourth one is the, the health and research uh, aspect. Uh, we cooperated very well during COVID, although you know we had a bit of a hiccup with Omicron. Uh, but uh, in the main, uh, we have benefited a great deal from uh, cooperating with the UK from a research point of view. I would say the fifth one was in an unexpected area, which is uh, in, uh, I would call it environmental issues, but particularly when we went to the Kew Gardens uh, on the horticultural uh, side of things where we were able to see how our own students are studying at the Kew Gardens uh, Institute or Learning Center uh, about uh, you know, plants, about conserving and preserving plants. And we got to hear that uh, plants that were taken from, you know, there are seeds that were taken from South Africa 200 years ago that were like captured from the Dutch and ended up in the UK and preserved uh, in a fairly sort of um, uh, ordinary way, uh, were found in a pouch and they were replanted and they germinated. So 200 years of plants from South Africa were replanted here. But the real cherry on top is that through cooperation with Kew Gardens, we are now setting up our own seed bank uh, uh, where we will have uh, the capability to store our seeds to ensure that plants that are uh, extension are preserved for posterity. And this is born out of the relationship between South Africa and the UK, particularly our Kirsten Bosch Botanical Gardens and Kew Gardens, uh, the relationship that has spent more than 100 years, but uh, more specifically, real good cooperation over 25 years. So those, for me, were the, the, the key highlights. And of course, the sixth one is to open up the, the gateways for tourism to be taken to another level between the UK and South Africa. And of course, at the trade level, if you really uh, like this aspect, is uh, that we could see more wines from South Africa being brought here. So uh, that, that will give many people their happy hour uh, when more wine is brought to, South, uh, to the UK. Okay. Uh, Mr. President, Oli Barrett from EMCA again. I just wondered if you could briefly characterise the personal rapport you found with the King, with the Prime Minister, and with Keir Starmer as well, who I think I heard you say you left your vote for him in his constituency. <laughs> was, that, was that an endorsement? <laughs> well, with uh, Keir Starmer, we, we, we had a meeting, a wonderful meeting with the leader of the opposition, the Labour Party, and as you well know, uh, the, taking putting on my, my party hat. The Labour Party and the ANC have uh, historical links, a long, uh, beneficial, mutually beneficial relationship. So I wished him well in whatever process that they will get involved in. And uh, yes, I said, you know, I, I left my vote there for him. <laughs> so he must go look for the vote because we went to his constituency. Um, the personal rapport with, with all three, <clears throat> as you correctly say, is very warm, very positive, and, and very engaging as well. Starting off with His Majesty the King, I had met the, the King on a number of occasions, either when he came to South Africa or when we were here, particularly during the last Commonwealth meeting, Heads of State meeting that was held here. So we've had exchanges and I'm a great admirer for the work that he has been doing and as I said at the dinner 
that he's been like a lone voice over many years on environmental issues and climate change. And now the, the world has awakened to the type of message that he has been putting across. So the rapport and uh, the, the engagement between the two of us is, is, is a, at a good level. And, and with the Prime Minister as well, we had wonderful rela uh, discussions. And uh, I had met him at one of the uh, global meetings. I think it was at COP27. Uh, so that is good. So on the whole, and, and I guess relationships are often really sort of the real test of whether uh, there'll be really good relationships between nations. Um, so at a personal level, I've been able to relate to all of them, and I do relate to all of them. And, uh, but more importantly, for the people in business, as people in the parliament as well. So it's, it's been a very fulfilling for all of us uh, who have been on this visit, ministers, myself, now officials, it's been a very fulfilling visit. And I must say that uh, this visit was well organized, uh, so well planned. And the planning started to way before even uh, when Her Majesty the King was, uh, the Queen rather, was still alive. They would started planning for this visit and uh, we were truly honored that uh, His Majesty the King was willing to take it forward even after uh, the passing of Her Majesty the Queen. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. President. Sorry to, we don't usually get the opportunity, but I, I did want to ask, you spoke about the ANC now. And when you go home, you're yes. going towards the ANC conference. Yes, sir. There are a number of important engagements coming up. One of them is the debate in Parliament on the Palapala report. Yes. You have major plans uh, going into if you're re-elected for your second term. Yes. How are you feeling ahead of that debate? And are you concerned that this matter may lead to your premature removal from office? No. Because of the service? No. I think I've, I've put my, my case forward. And of course, let us leave it to that panel to come up with... Uh, the, 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 the outcome, and uh, we cannot prejudge it. I can't, you can't, and we leave it in the hands of the panel. So they are best placed to deal with this matter. So any form of speculation, really, uh, is, is misplaced. Let's leave it to the panel to report, and anything else that flows from that, we handle then. And uh, we've proven capable of being able to handle issues as they happen. And uh, so let's, let's leave all that to that process. The debate? the debate as well. I think the debate will ensue. Uh, I'm not a member of parliament, so I will not be uh, in the debate. And uh, so they will be debating on the report. And uh, whatever the report uh, will be saying, they will debate it. And... So let's allow all those processes. And the good thing with our country is that we follow due process. We are governed by the rule of law. Uh, and this is when the test of our democracy really comes to the fore. This is when the test of our constitutional principles uh, are put on display. And uh, everyone else must sit back and see how that whole process uh, uh, eventuates. So I am a great believer in our democracy, in our constitution, and uh, I think let's all have faith in our democracy and constitution. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you colleagues. Thank you, Mr. President. You're welcome. Uh, there's a request for a group picture, Mr. President. A group picture with? With uh, Amanda.